I join this computer audio. Uh, a, a quick question for the city. I want to be sure I'm understanding uh, what we're looking at in terms of in terms of the law here. My understanding is, Your that, Honor. Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt. I wonder there is one preliminary matter. Oh, okay. That we wanted to address with you. Sure. Uh, and that is the city filed a, a new staff report. Uh, a week ago. And uh, I quickly prepared after I received it, a response to that new staff report. Uh, and I sent that to NOAA yesterday afternoon. Um, I'm advised by from him today that uh, he has not provided that document to you. The reasoning as I understand it is that um, he's he's taking the position that we had to submit all of our materials 14 days before the hearing. The problem is he didn't file his staff report until a week ago, seven days after that 14 day period expired. And since we carry the burden of proof, I think it's imperative that we have an opportunity to address the staff report that frames uh, the city's position in the case. Uh, and so I, I requested that. Um, uh, the city asked me to delay it and raise it with you now. I asked that it get to you before the hearing so you could review it, but we are where we are. And so I just wanted you to be aware that um, I have prepared the response to the city staff report I think I'm entitled to have that reviewed. I've submitted it to the city. And unless they've changed direction, my understanding is they haven't provided it to you. Okay. Um, so I, I have not seen uh, any any response to the staff report. Um, anything from the city on this? Yes, thank you. So as you probably remember, Mr. McKnight, last time we this hearing was scheduled, Mr. Anderson had submitted a number of materials either the day before or the day of the hearing itself. And because of those very late submissions, the city requested more time in order to review them. And as part of that extension, you set deadlines in for Mr. Anderson to provide any additional materials he wanted to provide, and then for the city to publish its staff report. And it did not set the deadline, and we're happy to refer you to, you know, the recording that you established the 14-day deadline for Mr. Anderson, and the city's deadline was seven days in advance. When it publishes its staff report for every other type of appeal, and that is so that the appellant's materials can be incorporated into the staff report that's published on the city's website so that the public has a chance to review the submissions of both parties at the same time, especially for these types of matters where the public has the right to participate in the public hearing that's a part of the administrative decision appeal process. Now, we just, again, yesterday at 4 59 p.m got this sir rebuttal by mr anderson our policies and procedures in addition to your you know verbal directive at the hearing says 14 days in advance so because our policies and procedures state that we thought it was not appropriate for the city staff to decide what should happen but instead what you would like to do whether you are you are willing to consider that late submission or not. Okay. Um, let me just ask a follow-up question for you know either either party is is uh, the nature of this rebuttal uh, more of like a legal brief or uh, like additional evidence and, and and that sort of a thing. Your Honor, it's uh, primarily a, a legal brief responding to the new staff report which I didn't receive until after the 14 day deadline expired. So it would have been impossible to respond to that new staff report before they submitted it. That's why this seems a little bit unusual. 
uh, it's primarily that, but there is some evidence that's discussed in that as well. Okay. Um, so uh, I think what I will do uh, at, at this point, you, you know, the city is correct in, in that the, the deadlines were set, the uh, policies and procedure uh, for the hearing officer that are published by the city do, I was just following the deadlines that are set there, really, right? Those are the rules. Um, having said that, um, and I just lost it here, I had it up, but um, in those uh, policies and procedures, it does um, allow for uh, additional material to be submitted uh, after the hearing, um, additional submissions, um, uh, or, or in this case, as part of the hearing. And so I, I will go ahead and receive uh, that information as well. Um, I obviously haven't had a chance to look at that, um, but if the city will forward that on to me or uh, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll take a look at that as part of the decision in this case. Thank you, um, Your Honor. Having said that, if there are any factual things that the city feels like it needs to, to address or rebut, well, um, I'm open to a motion for, for a submittal from them on that. I, I don't want to go back and forth forever, obviously, as far as um, you know, we can argue eternally, I'm sure, <laughs> but I uh, uh, also want to be sure that all the parties have a chance to to present all, all, all the evidence that they feel is necessary. And so um, I will receive that if, if the city feels it absolutely necessary to um, to supplement the record uh, as to the evidence based on that, I, I, I will consider, a, you know, a motion. Um, uh, Mr. McKnight, well, based on, you know, the submission that we've received so far, I don't think that's necessary. I think it's mostly Mr. Anderson repeating arguments that he's made in prior submissions. Um, but I'd still like to reserve that right, you know, to revisit this issue, depending on, you know, what we hear tonight in case something new is brought up. Okay. Of a factual nature. Well, well let's, let's, um, uh, if you will, Ms. Pasker, remind me uh at the end of the hearing to bring this back up again i'd like to discuss it at that point and kind of see where everybody's at great okay um a anything else uh preliminary preliminarily from the parties no your honor okay <clears throat> um so uh, kind of a preliminary question that i had and just to be sure that i was i'm I'm on the right page, uh, literally here, is I want to be sure I understand kind of the legislative history of this, of the ordinance that we're dealing with. Um, and, and so I'm going to ask the city to to clarify for me if, if what I'm understanding is correct. And that is that um, section 21A34020, the historic preservation overlay district section uh, was was changed by ordinance 67 and then um it sounds like it may have been changed since then is that correct have, have there been additional amendments to that section since ordinance 67 no no there have not so so um that was, that was the ordinance that allowed staff to deny at the administrative level amongst other changes amongst other changes okay the and standards then, of review were not changed as part of that ordinance okay so, so and, and and to be clear when you say standards of review we're talking about subsection g that's correct okay but it looks like maybe subsection e was changed uh if that is yes okay. yes as part of ordinance it was clarified Yes. Mm -hmm. And then, That's um, like yes. Mm -hmm. So I guess kind of a follow up for that is, um, is it possible that the city could provide me as an additional submission as well, like a red line of ordinance 67 so that I can see what was changed and all of that? Absolutely. Perfect. Thank you. Um, could I, Your Honor, could I get a copy of that as well? Yeah. If you forward that on to Mr. Anderson as well, that I would appreciate that. We'd be happy to do that. Thank you. 
Okay. Just to make sure I'm clear about what it is that you're looking for. Is it just that subsection or the entire? I, I, I'm interested in, in, in all of Ordinance 67. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd like to see anything as it relates to, to Section 21A34020. Thank you. And, and and you don't have to scramble for that right now necessarily. I uh, just want to be sure I'm clear as I'm as I'm writing the decision as to what what was what. Absolutely. Thank you. <clears throat> um, all right. So uh, with, with that kind of out of the way, I I'd like to go through kind of the normal hearing process. Well, I'd, I'd like uh, Mr. Anderson to present uh, whatever he'd like to. I'll turn some time over to the city to do the same. We'll have public comments, and then we'll we'll allow each of the parties to to address anything that was made in public comment or 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 that was otherwise uh, said. So, uh, Mr. Anderson, go ahead and, and kick off for us. Thank you. Well, if you don't mind, I'll just call you Your Honor um, out of habit. But uh, thank you, and thank you to the city uh, staff uh, for. Uh, their um, participation as well. Uh, first of all, the argument that I'm making is primarily a legal argument. Um, uh, and there are three legal arguments that, uh, that I'm making. The first is that there is, as a matter of law, uh, there is no requirement to obtain a certificate of appropriateness, appropriateness or COA uh, to paint exterior brick. The second is, even if there were that kind of a requirement and um, a certificate, a COA is required, as a matter of law, under the statutes, the ordinances as they exist, um, there is no uh, right for the city to deny that COA in this case under its own ordinances. And third are a couple of procedural issues that, that we'll get to um, uh, as we go through those. But starting with the first one, uh, as a matter of law, no COA is required to paint exterior brick. Um, all of this falls under the auspices or the heading of Utah Code 10-9A-801, uh, sub three, sub C, which says that a land use decision is illegal if the decision, A, is based on incorrect interpretation of land use regulations, uh, B, conflicts with the authority granted by this title, or C, is contrary to law. It's my opinion that this, um, ordinance as interpreted by the city, uh, that's the um, uh, MC 21A.34.020.E, .E, that ordinance um, is both incorrectly interpreted, so it's incorrect uh, in its interpretation, and it's contrary to law. Uh, and the same is true with the issues on whether a COA could be denied under subsection G of that same 020. So with respect to why as a matter of law, the ordinance uh, does not require a COA, uh, the starting point really is a, um, statute, a rule of statutory construction that is imposed by case authority and by statute that is sort of a, has omnibus coverage on any issue dealing with the restriction of the use of a property owner's property. So when there are ordinances involved that would restrict the use of the property's owner's property, this law applies. And uh, let me just uh, read quickly the, the provision. First of all, by case authority, the court has said, quote, because zoning ordinances are in derogation of a property owner's common law right to, to unrestricted use of his or her property, 
provisions therein restricting property uses should be strictly construed and provisions permitting property uses should be liberally construed to favor the property owner. Uh, that was a, a case of Patterson versus Utah County. It's a Utah Court of Appeals case cited in the materials. The Utah Supreme Court subsequently adopted and emphasized that holding stating, quote, since zoning ordinances are in derogation of a property owner's use of land, any ordinance prohibiting a use should be strictly construed in favor of allowing the use. So that's this omnibus overriding um, case law that applies to statutory and interpretation of ordinances restricting property usage. Uh, there's also a, an ordinance that applies to um, applications, land use applications that are made. So that would apply to the second argument I'm making, the subsection G of O2O. Uh, and, that, and that provides that um, when a city is reviewing uh, applications, land use applications, uh, it, anything that isn't plainly stated must be strictly construed against the city. Uh, so, so that's at the 30,000 foot level, the law that governs this proceeding. Now going beyond that quickly, and I'll run through these fast, uh, but uh, and as you review the memorandum that I submitted yesterday in response to the new staff report, uh, this will be covered. Uh, but um, secondly, the case authority states specific statutory provisions prevail, that's the word used by the courts, prevail over more general provisions. So in a, in a, within a particular ordinance, specific provisions prevail over more general provisions. Um, in this particular case, there's uh, in section 020.E, the first sentence is very, uh, very general. And as your honor knows, it says to the effect that um, alterations uh, should not be made to um, exterior, uh, to the exterior of a property with, without a COA. And then the next sentence is very specific. And it says, I'll read you the language. Uh, the next sentence says that um, certificates of appropriateness, this is quote, quote, certificates of appropriateness shall be required for, and then it lists 13 subparagraphs that uh, specify when COAs are required. Uh, none of those requires that um, a COA be obtained to paint exterior brick. The case authority in Utah uh, that I've cited is Osawala Vietna Life. It's in materials for the full site. It says that, quote, specific provisions prevail over more general expressions. And those, that section that says certificates of appropriateness shall be required for, and then list the 13 circumstances. That is very specific and it prevails over the more general. Um, next point, just to move through quickly, the case law also uh, in a similar vein, but different, says that more specific ordinances prevail over more general ordinances. And so we're not talking about within a single ordinance, but if there are two different ordinances in the city's uh, municipal code, one that deals specifically with a topic and another that deals with it peripherally or generally, the more, the more specific ordinance governs. Um, so uh, the purpose of section E, 020.E, 
is to define when COAs are required. We just talked about what that language says. There's a general sentence, and then there's the specific language that says certificates of, of uh, um, appropriateness are required for, and then it lists the 13 circumstances. Uh, the city has referenced another uh, provision of its municipal code. It's 21A-04-030 G, uh, excuse me, not G, just 030. And that provision uh, doesn't deal specifically with certificates of appropriateness. It deals instead with building permits and demolition permits, but it does contain uh, kind of a stray sentence, the last sentence of that uh, section, that ordinance, that deals uh, with certificates of appropriateness. The city takes the position that that sentence in this different ordinance dealing with a different topic, uh, building permits and demolition permits, somehow expands the very specific ordinance uh, section E, 020.E, that deals with certificates of, of appropriateness. And the case law says in the, that circumstance where you have one ordinance that's very specific, dealing with a particular topic, another in a different section that is more general dealing with a different, to different topic, the more specific ordinance controls. And so this ordinance point 030 is very general. It doesn't specifically, and certainly not in its entirety, it doesn't deal with certificates of appropriateness. And so it's limited, it doesn't, it doesn't apply. Uh, the more specific uh, controls. Uh, I point that, that out only because the city raised that. I don't think it adds anything to their position. I think it's a bad, a bad argument that isn't supported by the law. And in fact, that provision as the city reads it would mean that any time any project is undertaken that enhances, quote, enhances value or excellence of a property, uh, then that requires a certificate of appropriateness, a COA. Well, that means that any interior any interior improvement requires a COA. It means that replacing carpet would require a COA. It means that washing interior windows would require a COA because they add value and certainly improve the excellence of the property. I mean, it extends to so many things that are far beyond the scope of the specific provision, subsection E, uh, that it, it doesn't apply. And that's what the case law says there about six or seven cases that are cited here, neither in this section or the one I just finished talking about where the general provision of the same ordinance is prevailed over uh, by the more specific. Uh, the city hasn't responded to the cases cited. It hasn't distinguished them. It's just ignored them. Uh, next point. Uh, this is related, but again, slightly different. Specific ordinance provisions control over general policy statements or statements of intent or preambles. Um, I think at the very best, uh, uh, giving all deference to the, the city's construction, the first very broad sentence of this ordinance is at its best, nothing more than a statement of intent or policy um, or just a very general preamble. Uh, and in that event, essentially, uh, the provision is saying that uh, the first sentence says uh, that um, alterations to structure, exterior structures, sites and properties are subject to COAs. And then the next sentence says, which limits, uh, which are limited to the list, which follows. And the list is the 13 paragraphs that we discussed. So by that, by that statutory construction rule as well, um, the requirements for COA are limited to the, are limited to those 13 paragraphs. Next rule of construction, the doctrine of ejusdem generis, 
generis. It cuts against the city's position. That doctrine is again similar but different. And that doctrine establishes that if there's a general catch-all provision that is either preceded or followed by a list of specifics, the meaning of that general catch-all provision is limited to the um, to the content, quote, content of the terms of the list, close quote. Uh, the Utah Supreme Court has ruled on this doctrine recently uh, in 2018, the uh, GeoMet Watch case cited in the materials. And it says, this is the Supreme Court speaking, in its simplest terms, Ejusdem generis posits that general catch-all terms appearing at the beginning or the end of an exemplary statutory list are understood to be informed by the content of the terms of the list. In this case, we have the 13 paragraphs that are the content of the terms of the list. And so they narrow, they um, limit the question of when are COAs required. They're limited to the specific content of the terms of those paragraphs. Uh, next, and I'll, this will go faster as we go along, Your Honor, but uh, statutory construction avoids unnecessary provisions. Did you have a question? No, no go ahead. I never... Okay. okay. Um, it avoids, it sh uh, ordinance should be construed or interpreted to avoid unnecessary provisions or superfluous provisions. In this particular case, if the first sentence of this ordinance, o to o point e is intended to have the very broad um, scope that the city argues, there is no need to have the statement that certificates of uh, appropriateness are required for and then listing the 13. That's just superfluous. It means nothing more. Um, because of that, uh, the statute should be read to give meaning to the entire, or the ordinance should be read to give meaning to the entire ordinance. To do that, a proper reading would be that um, the very general statement of the first sentence uh, is, uh, indicates in effect that COAs are required. Uh, and then the second sentence indicates that uh, the required is limited in the second sentence and it's 13 paragraphs. So uh, in essence, Your Honor, the first sentence of Municipal Code 21A-34.020E is a very general policy statement of intent or purpose. The uh, exterior alterations to structures, sites, and properties are subject to COAs, the list of which is identified in the second sentence and its 13 limiting paragraphs. Uh, we're almost done with these uh, rules of construction. The next one, Your Honor, is the rule of omissions. Uh, a very prominent uh, rule of statutory construction is that words that are omitted uh, have the omission of those words has meaning. And the case law says, the Utah Supreme Court explains thus, we should give effect to any omission in the ordinance by presuming that the omission is purposeful. Uh, that's in the Monticello case. It, the court said something similar a few years before, quote, an omission in an ordinance should be given effect by a presumption that the omission was purposeful. That's the Biddle case. Uh, so here, the fact that not one of the requirements for one of the provisions in um, o to o point e mentions painting, not one of them excludes painting, not one of them requires a COA for painting. 
it goes into excruciating detail in the 13 paragraphs on things that are uh, that do require a COA, not one word about painting. It's omitted. That omission is purposeful and brings a presumption. Um, the city argues that uh, one of the one of the 13 paragraphs, which is E.8, which deals with masonry work, somehow that prohibits painting. The language of that section does not say that or mean that. The language simply says masonry work, including but not limited to tuck pointing, sandblasting, and chemical cleaning. That's what it says. So that's what's per, that's what requires the COA under that section. That does not give fair notice to reasonable people that a COA is required for painting. Uh, next one, the city's prior interpretation of its ordinance has no evidentiary value. The city has mentioned in several points in its new staff report uh, about um, enforcement actions it has taken based on exterior painting, based on its interpretation of its ordinances. That is improper. It's inadmissible. It's non-probative because the language, the meaning of the language of the city's ordinances isn't characterized by past enforcement actions. It's only characterized or it's only determined as a matter of law, as a matter of correctness. Um, the, uh, the case law says a land use decision is illegal if it violates a law statute or ordinance in effect at the time the decision was made. This is the Burmese case side of the materials. Continues, we review a lower court's interpretation of a set of statutes or ordinances for correctness. And then in the footnote, your honor, uh, side of the materials, this, this is really important. I'll just highlight it. It's footnote 13 of the case of out front media versus Salt Lake City. In footnote 13, the court says, this is the Supreme Court. In the past, we afforded some level of non-binding deference to a local agency's interpretation of its own ordinance. Uh, and then omitting the citation, but this deference cannot stand in view of the subsequent developments in our precedent. And then the court concluded, uh, we review the interpretation of ordinances for correctness. So the fact that the city may have a history of incorrectly interpreting this ordinance doesn't lend strength to their argument. Um, this is determined by, as a matter of correctness, based on the language of the ordinance and the rules of construction that we just went through. Um, finally, this is the end of this first uh, section. The city argues that it is not, quote, required to write ordinances so that they only include the fewest amount of words necessary. And it says that. But my response is the city is required to draft its ordinances with clarity, consistent with the rules of statutory construction that we've just reviewed. Since zoning ordinances are in derogation of a property owner's use of land, any ordinance prohibiting a proposed use should be strictly construed in favor of allowing the use. Um, so that, Your Honor, is my position on why there is no certificate of appropriateness required for painting exterior brick. The city says, well, how could we make it any more clear? And the answer is, you just say, as you did with the other 13 issues that you said require COAs, you say COAs are required for painting exterior brick. It's as simple as that. The city's revision of its ordinance that your honor inquired about a few minutes ago, that 
to a certain extent resolves that issue. So the, the issue we're talking about today is limited in the sense that the ordinance is now different. The city has amended it and been more clear, but at all times applicable to this matter, the ordinance was not sufficiently clear. The city could have fixed it. It controls the legislative process, but it didn't. So that's why as a matter of law, a COA is not required. Second point, um, even if it were required, a COA is not- Stop you there. Sorry, yes, I just got a question. And, and um, to a certain extent, this is a little bit unfair because it's not an issue that was brought up by either of the parties, but I am curious what, what your position is on it. Um, is, is the fact that an application for a certificate of appropriateness, the fact that it was submitted, is that, does that act as a waiver of any kind as to the argument that it wasn't required in the first place? Well, it's not a waiver. Um, that issue was raised and preserved in our statement of issues on appeal. The city um, filed uh, a, um, I'm trying to think of the term they use, uh, uh, an enforcement order. Enforcement action? Enforcement action, thank you, to correct the problem. Uh, I, I called the enforcement officer as I was asked to do in the enforcement letter. The officer said, what you need to do is file this application, which I filed. And so that's why that was done, but it is with the reservation of rights. And, and this issue was preserved in our notice of issues on appeal. Okay. It, 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 the reason I ask is um, it, that seems like an argument that would would be stronger in an enforcement action, right? If, if you're at a hearing there and, I, and, and, and I'm gonna be honest, I'm not entirely familiar with the city's procedures on enforcement actions, but um, if there is an enforcement action uh, saying, hey, uh, you, you painted this, you needed a certificate of appropriateness to do this, um, isn't that the correct forum to bring up the argument that a certificate of, of appropriateness isn't required in the first place? Well, it certainly could be brought there. We haven't reached that point in the enforcement action. Um, and so it, it hasn't been raised in that action at this point. Hopefully we don't have to get there, but if we do, it'd be raised, okay? Okay. So the next point is- uh, even If, if I can respond. Um, go ahead and make a note, Ms. Pasker, and, and I'll, I'll let you do that. Uh, I, I think um, after, after Mr. Anderson's had a chance to present everything, that's all right. So uh, even if a COA were uh, required, which we, which it isn't, um, it's not prohibited uh, by, uh, for painting exterior brick. It shouldn't be denied for painting exterior brick. Um, and uh, it fails for the same reasons as we've discussed uh, above in the prior argument. Um, the city's interpretation of the particular section, which is its municipal code 21A-34 or dot 34 dot 020G. So G are the standards on um, issuing COAs. Uh, fails for the same reasons because the statute, the ordinance rather, never mentions in any one of the 11 standards that um, COA should not be issued for painting exterior brick or they should be lit, issued cautiously. There's no mention of painting exterior brick in any one of those 11 standards. Um, the city's response to that uh, is, well, you've got to look at the design guidelines and read those in connection with the design standards. And they've cited, uh, I think three uh, design guidelines, not one of them mentions that you cannot paint exterior brick. Um, the city focuses primarily the closest, the closest it comes to finding any support uh, in the guidelines is in guideline 2.6. Uh, and uh, 
And the city says that particular guideline means that if a particular brick structure has not previously been painted, the brick of that structure can never be painted. That's the city's position. That is not what design guideline 2.6 says, not close to what it says. This is what the guideline says, quote, masonry that was not painted traditionally should not be painted. That doesn't mean that if a particular house hasn't been painted before, it can never be painted. It means that if brick generally was never traditionally painted, then it can't be painted. Actually, it doesn't refer to brick, it says masonry. So masonry that was not traditionally painted cannot be painted. The city has indicated, and we, we agree, there are a number of types of masonry that are covered by the city's code. There's not only brick, there's cinder block, there's terracotta, there's adobe, there's stucco, there's concrete, there's natural stone, there's cultured stone. There are a whole host of types of masonry. If there is a certain type of masonry that hasn't been traditionally painted, maybe stone, maybe terracotta, I don't know what it is, but if there's a certain type that hasn't been traditionally painted, then that shouldn't be painted. But one thing is certain, brick, exterior brick has been traditionally painted. That is attested to by over 300 painted brick residences in the historic district. Um, resin, painted brick residences that date back a hundred years. And so to say that um, a brick can't be painted is not only inconsistent with the language of the ordinance, but inconsistent with the actual facts on the ground, the painted brick buildings on the ground on the same street where this duplex is located. And this is just the width, this is just the length of the street within the historic district. There are 54 painted brick homes. They're all around the subject property, not immediately on either side, but beyond that by a, a residence or two and directly across the street, there are a number of them. And the full length of the road, these brick homes are found and not only on 200 West, where the duplex is located, but throughout the entire neighborhood. Your Honor, we submitted earlier in this case, um, a document that's in the record. Um, I'll just hold this up so that it appears on the screen for a minute. Okay. Um, you can see that it's entitled, Painted Brick Houses in the Capitol Hill Historic Preservation District and Capitol Hill Extension. Yeah, I've got that pulled up here. <clears throat> yeah, this, this goes through as I drove around the area, uh, this, these are the houses that I noticed. There certainly are some that I could have missed. But based on that, there are at least, there are 302 painted brick residences. Um, the colors are distributed. White painted brick is 64. Gray painted brick is 50. Green painted brick is 38. Tan or brown painted brick is 45. And, and sorry, can I just ask these colors, Are is that the color of the paint? That's the color of the paint, thank you. Uh, 45, blue painted brick is 30. Yellow painted brick is 21. Orange painted brick is 18. Purple painted brick is two um, that I saw. And so there are hundreds of these painted brick houses they add so much charm and character to the whole historic district that I think uh, most people that think the historic uh, district is beautiful think that because of the beauty of the colored and character of the colored brick buildings. Um, also, Your Honor, I don't know if you can see this, but I'll bring it a little bit closer. I took pictures of this and submitted them into the record before our last hearing. This is this is a document that shows the Capitol Hill Historic District and the Capitol Hill Extension. It has push pins that represent the location of each of these painted brick houses. And they're color coded, although 
some of them were clear and so the color was marked on the end. They're a little bit harder to tell. But this shows the actual distribution of the 300 brick residences through the Capitol Hill historic district that we discussed. So, uh, Your Honor, that kind of covers this point on uh, why a COA should not be uh, restricted. The city states, quote, it's difficult to understand how much clearer the city standards need to be in order to reach the plainly restrict threshold, close quote. Uh, and the reference to plainly restrict is to uh, state statute 10-9A-603, um, paren 2, which is the, the statute that uh, indicates that um, if a land use application is made, uh, and it's not plain, and a use isn't quote plainly restricted. Um, the uh, use should be permitted, or at least the the, the ordinance should be interpreted uh, in favor of the land use application. Uh, the city again says it's difficult to understand how much clearer the city standards need to be uh, in order to reach that plainly restricted threshold. And the answer is simple: they simply need to indicate in one of the uh, 11 standards, and if they want in one of the design guidelines, that painting brick, uh, exterior brick uh, is prohibited and that COAs will not be uh, permitted. It doesn't say that. Nowhere does the ordinance language say that. Um, again, the city controls the legislative process. It could have fixed the issue uh, that's part of the reason why the burden is against the city and in favor of the property owner, but it didn't. It failed to do so unless it did so as part of its recent amendments. Your Honor, the, the next uh, issue is the city's, uh, their procedural arguments. Uh, and can, I, can I ask a few questions on what uh, of course. you just discussed there? So you've provided um, all these examples of of places that have been painted, um, and it is it is quite a few. Uh, I I guess um, one question that I have is to what extent so so where the guideline says masonry that was not painted traditionally should not be painted, I I think the city makes an argument that. Um, the this type of masonry during this historical era, and I'm trying to remember, but it was like the 50s to 60s. Um, that tradi that buildings during that time period were not traditionally painted brick buildings. Um, I I guess my question for you is, where it says not traditionally painted, do you think that the that distinction matters as far as what does traditionally mean? Is are we talking within a certain decade, within a certain sort of historical era? Are we talking historical buildings at all? Yeah, good question, Your Honor. And I think the answer is twofold. First, the city uh, is the one who drafted the ordinance and it's not clear, it's vague, it's ambiguous. And under the law, then you interpret it against the city and in favor of the property use. That's what the law plainly says. So for that reason, uh, uh, the city's argument fails. Secondly, I think that uh, it doesn't matter if this particular building or even if a building built in the same year with the same kind of brick was, was already painted. It means that if brick, brick is a type of masonry, if brick was traditionally painted, then it can be painted. Um, it's not saying that if a particular house hadn't been painted, it can never be painted. It just means if brick, if, if a type of masonry was not traditionally painted, maybe if the house was cultured stone or if it was terracotta on the exterior, 
maybe there's an argument that that wasn't traditionally painted. Brick has been traditionally painted for decades, for generations, for over a century in that district. And it, that certainly qualifies as being traditionally painted under the language, the vague, ambiguous language of the ordinance. Okay, thank you. Okay, so Your Honor, quickly, um, we believe the city didn't properly uh, or timely render its decision in this case. Um, the statute, rather the ordinance as we uh, read it and interpret it, uh, requires that uh, a decision be made within 30 days. The city did not uh, make a decision until over 60 days. It, it didn't meet the deadline. Uh, the city says, well, only you only have to give a, uh, an approval within 30 days. And I guess their inference is that you never, there is no time deadline to give a denial. Um, I think that language doesn't pass the smell test on statutory construction. That doesn't make any sense from a practical standpoint. It would be improper to um, get a, to have the right to get a response within 30 days and not to be able to get a response within six, within 60 days or six months or six years, no deadline. The city also has argued uh, that um, it did in effect give a uh, response within 30 days because it sent to, to uh, me, uh, Noah Elmore sent to me, I think about December 6th or 7th or maybe 13th, somewhere in that time frame a letter providing uh, initial, their initial or his initial reasoning. Uh, I responded to that and, uh, on December 6th, December 13th, maybe even a little bit earlier and said, is this a decision? Because if it is, I wanna know so I can file my appeal. He wrote back and said, no, this isn't a decision. There has been no decision. When a decision's made, we'll get a hold of you, and it came several weeks later. So uh, I don't think it's fair for the city to say that the decision was timely made. Uh, in any event, Your Honor, um, in addition to that problem, the same, oh, the city makes one other argument, and that is even if there were a mistake made, it's a ministerial, innocuous problem, uh, no harm, no foul. My response to that is the city has said several times in their papers that uh, if an ordinance is mandatory, it has no choice. It has to comply with the ordinance. This ordinance is mandatory. It says the city shall um, uh, provide that within 30 days. So uh, next, uh, next argument is that the same provision says that the decision needs to be based on written findings of fact. The decision that was submitted ultimately by the city has a section labeled findings of fact, but they aren't findings of fact, they're conclusions of law. And so that requirement, that mandatory shall requirement uh, of providing findings of fact supporting the decision wasn't satisfied. Um, next point, Your Honor, is just a, a general argument uh, that the process that the city has implemented here. I, I'm sorry, can I? <laughs> yes. I, I, I want to ask about this procedural issue. Sure. Um, I have a qu couple questions about that if, if, if you're kind of moving on of to course. the next point. Um, <clears throat> So I guess I'm struggling with no, no question the ordinance says that it, it needs to be approved within 30 days. It doesn't necessarily need to be, say it, it needs to be denied within 30 days, but but let's assume it does or, 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 or treat it as though mm -hmm. that is that is what's required. Um, I, I'm struggling to determine like what's the remedy for a violation of that? 
um, if if the city doesn't send out a decision within those 30 days, um, what makes automatic approval of the application the appropriate remedy as opposed to, so for example, I've, I've uh, seen in other city ordinances um, situations where if, if the city doesn't make its decision by the deadline that's outlined, uh, the remedy is that the application is considered denied and the applicant can move forward with the appeal process to kind of get the ball rolling or whatever. Um, I, I I don't know if, if uh, Salt Lake's ordinance uh, specifically provides that remedy in any way, but um, why should the remedy that you're requesting be granted as opposed to, to something a little bit less extreme? Well, I guess the answer, Your Honor, is it goes back to that overarching principle of law that we talked about at the beginning. Um, if the city doesn't specify that a failure to timely deny an ordinance um, simply requires the decision to be reconsidered or for another hearing, be, if, it, if it can be remedied, the city needs to say that it can be remedied. That needs to be a part of the ordinance. Because again, the ordinance, because it's dealing with restrictions of land use, is required to be interpreted strictly against the city and in favor of the land uses. And so I think it's not fair for the city to argue that um, this mandatory ordinance, shall ordinance, means nothing if the city doesn't comply, unless there's a provision that says that. And I haven't seen it. I'm certainly not as facile with the city's code as, as Council for the city may be, or Mr. Elmore may be. And so if there's a provision, uh, it would be instructive to hear it. I'm not aware of it. If there isn't one, I think you interpret against the city and in favor of the property owner. And on that, on that issue, just one final point, Your Honor, on this statutory construction discussion we've had. Because of that mandatory overlay regarding that statutes restricting property uses are interpreted against the city and in favor of the land use. Um, with that in mind, look at the circumstances of this case. To me, it appears that at every stage and in every instance, anytime there's any ambiguity, the city is interpreting the ordinance in favor of the city, instead of interpreting the ordinance as the law requires in favor of the land use. Um, anyway, that's how I respond to that question. Okay. And then my, my other question is kind of remedy-esque in the sense that, um, again, assuming that no findings of fact were made uh, contrary to what's required by the ordinance, um, it isn't the remedy for that this this hearing where it's de novo this um we have a de novo hearing today uh where, where findings of fact will result from it um does that does that remedy that failure to include findings of fact in the in the decision well i think uh, if the court decides that no proper findings of fact were made then the decision was void ab initio. Uh, it didn't comply with the requirements. And so it's invalid. Uh, and so it shouldn't be up on appeal. Uh, it's over, I think. I think that's the proper interpretation. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Uh, the second on the procedural issues, the second argument is um, the decisional process is, in this case, it's backwards, it's improper, it's prejudicial. Uh, the fact that the initial hearing, a decision was made before there was a hearing, before there was any opportunity to present um, legal arguments or uh, evidence, 
a decision was made. And I know the statute, the ordinance permits it, but I, uh, I have questions about the propriety of that. The city cited a couple of cases that they say support it, um, but, but now I see a compounding effect that adds to this ongoing issue. And the compounding effect is the, um, well, it's illustrated by what happened today in terms of the city taking the position that the property owner is not entitled to respond in writing to a city's new staff report. That I think goes beyond the pale of what is uh, appropriate from a procedural due process standpoint. If I have the burden of proof, I certainly am entitled to respond to the city's new staff report and they can't dodge it by delaying the staff report until the 14 day period has already expired. And then they submit the staff report and say, you can't respond to it because your 14 days to respond has already expired. What kind of argument is that? To say that um, I'm denied the opportunity to respond because they didn't uh, file their staff report in time to enable me to respond. I think it creates an impossible outcome that's prejudicial, blatantly prejudicial to a property owner. Um, another aspect of this whole backward situation where you don't get a hearing initially, a decision's just made, it's, it's kind of a situation where don't bother me with the law or the facts, I've got a decision to write. Um, a decision's made before we get to tell them what the law should be or present evidence to guide their decision. And the response, of course, is, well, you get a evidentiary hearing by filing your appeal. Uh, and uh, the problem is that imposes additional burdens, additional costs, and the decision's already been made. In addition to that, the procedural aspect that surfaced today and what we went through that really concerns me is the author of the decision acting as the judge makes a decision. That person then shepherds through the, um, the process, in essence being the prosecutor of the city's position in the subsequent briefing uh, before uh, uh, the hearing officer. And they also are the gatekeeper that prevents any access from anyone else to the hearing officer. And so if they decide not to submit a document to the hearing officer, you just don't hear about it. It's a unilateral decision the city makes to prevent you from seeing or receiving additional evidence that we, we have every right to present because they didn't provide their uh, new staff report in time to be responded to under their, under their timetable. Uh, and, and yet they're the ones who, who make the decision that you won't get a copy of it. You don't get to see it. Uh, unless I raise it. I think, I think this whole process, it has certainly revealed to me that it is not a fair process uh, and it violates fundamental fairness requirements and procedural due process requirements where you have the judge and the prosecutor and the gatekeeper for the hearing officer, the same person who works for the city. Anyway, that's that's enough about that. Uh, I do want to add the follow up question on that issue. Yes. Can I just add one more thing? Just Definitely. so no one has a misconstruction. I do want to add that um, in working with the city personnel, every one of them has been very professional. Every one of them has been helpful. Um, and so I don't mean to uh, cast aspersions on that at all. I'm just saying that the process itself as structured, and today wasn't as helpful, they haven't been as helpful today as they have been in the past. And I think it, it clearly was improper, but, but generally speaking, they've been terrific. And um, I'm just focusing on the process. And I think the process is improper. I think it's unfair. 
I think it violates procedural due process, particularly with respect to the additional issues we've talked about. Um, on, on the due process yeah. uh, argument. Oh, I'm sorry. sorry. Yeah, thank you. Um, in the interest of everybody, the respect for everybody's time, the applicant has gone well over the recommended 30 minutes. Um, and we should move this along. Um, well, 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 let me ask you this question, Mr. Anderson, and then, and then, and then we'll address that. Um, your due process argument, does it, uh, uh, is it focused on kind of the constitutional due process that's required and, and, and general fairness, or are you, um, trying to claim that as well, that under the city ordinance, uh, you should have received a hearing from the historical commission, uh, historical preservation commission. Um, I would respond by saying I wanted to hear, have the hearing by the historical commission. I requested that, uh, the city told me they would not permit that, that instead they'd use this process. Uh, so I've been unhappy with the process from the start, particularly where I requested a hearing, the opportunity to present evidence. And, but, um, in response to your direct question, uh, I'm not aware of a, uh, an ordinance that um, aids my argument in particular, other than the, the timing argument of the city based on when the due dates are. If that's what the position of the city is, if that's what the ordinance really says, if I can't respond to a um, new filing by the city as important as a staff report, because they've constructed a time frame that makes it impossible because they don't have to file the staff report until the deadline for me to respond is passed. That I think does create, that ordinance aspect of it does create uh, a fairness and a due process problem. Other than that, I'm, I think it's primarily just based on common law as opposed to city ordinances. Okay, and, and then I'll just ask, are, are, are you close to having addressed what you wanted me to hear or? Yeah, you know, I, I'll, if I could just take five more minutes. I've got That's fine. one last section that the city raises in their new staff report. It talks about has, paint, has brick been painted traditionally? We've covered that already and so I won't cover it again. Okay. Uh, but uh, I think you understand the issue. Talk about paint formulation. Um, uh, the city continues to argue that you can't paint brick because it seals in, it traps moisture. Uh, and uh, to the contrary, if you, paint, if you paint brick with the wrong kind of paint, that may be true. But uh, that's an old issue that's been resolved by the development of uh, special paints formulated by uh, the uh, prominent paint manufacturers that allows, that's made for painting brick. It allows moisture to pass uh, so that it's not trapped in the stone causing damage. Uh, and uh, we've submitted an expert witness report that discusses that. Uh, not only was the proper paint used, the proper painting system was used to avoid those kinds of problems. Uh, the removal of paint, this is the final issue. Uh, this is a, uh, an issue that the city spends lots of time on. Uh, it talks about lots of enforcement actions. As I've discussed before, I think discussing enforcement actions is improper because it has no probative value. You don't interpret a statute based on what the city has done in the past. In terms of enforcement actions, you interpret it based on the rules of statutory construction. Um, in any event, uh, the city indicates that, that there is this new chemical treatment process that removes paint from brick. Um, and they say it can be done without causing damage to the brick. In reality, it causes damage to the brick mortar, significant damage to the brick mortar. I've spoken with one of the property owners uh, that was involved in that type of a process at the requirement of the city and uh, uh, was told that it causes significant damage to the mortar. And the cost of that process is exorbitant. It's $30,000 for, 
for uh, a duplex the size of the duplex that I have. Thirty thousand dollars. That's the chemical removal process. That's the, the chemical pump. removal process. Oh, okay. Um, even if, uh, even if otherwise that was okay, it's prohibited by a mandatory city ordinance. Uh, the ordinance is twenty one A dash thirty four dash O two O G. So it's the standards governing when a COA can be denied, a COA application can be denied. Uh, the city refers to standard seven. Uh, and uh, uh, ironically, standard seven cuts against the city's position because it says that, quote, chemical or physical treatments such as sandblasting that cause damage to historic materials shall not be used. So the operative term is, if it causes chemical processes or chemical treatments is the word, that cause damage to historical treatments shall not be used, mandatory shall not be used. In this case, even the city now admits that this process causes damage uh, they say, uh, I think their term is minor or something like that, uh, damage to the brick mortar. Uh, the statute doesn't care. The statute doesn't require significant damage. It simply requires that cause damage to the historic material. The city has acknowledged in the past that mortar is a historic material in the brick masonry process. So with that, Your Honor, um, I appreciate your time and patience and uh, thank you for your uh, attention and comments. Thank you for the presentation, Mr. Anderson. Um, I'll turn the time over now to Ms. Well, to the city, Ms. Pasker, Mr. Elmore, whoever wants to start off there to uh, provide the city's response. I'll, I can begin and then I'll defer any remaining time to my colleagues. I'll just start, this is, regarding historic preservation. This is work done in a local historic preservation district. So I'm gonna refer and discuss the historic preservation standards. So regarding standards two, three, five, the historic character, the historic character is not just two-story brick duplex as the appellant describes it. Um, when the subject duplex was built in 1953, it was the third of a series of three duplexes on 200 West each constructed with an unpainted masonry finish, characteristic of the post-war period of significance. But the masonry is not just defined by how it is unpainted, but specifically it's red striated brick with flush light colored mortar joints. By painting over the brick, the masonry becomes obscured, makes it difficult to place the structure within its historic context. And because masonry was not painted prior to 2023, Painting the subject building's bricks degrades the historic integrity of the brick and the entire structure. It does not reflect its true historic character, i.e. unpainted masonry characteristic and traditional of the post-war construction. When the guidelines plainly state masonry that was not painted traditionally should not be painted, this is what the guideline is referring to. This is why the very first bullet point included in the standard references a brick's hard outer layer known as the fire skin, which was specifically designed not to be painted. It does not mean that because one form of masonry may have been painted at one point in the past, then all masonry should be painted. And regarding standard seven, eight, and nine, standard seven stipulates chemical or physical treatments that cause damage to historic materials shall not be used while standards eight and nine note contemporary design shall not be discouraged when they do not destroy historic material and if an alteration were to be removed integrity of the structure would be unimpaired paint is a treatment on masonry plain and simple furthermore it is a treatment which prevents the historic brick from functioning the way it was designed you have that outer skin brick was designed to allow moisture to evaporate Paint prevents moisture from evaporating and over time will irrevocably damage the historic brick material, potentially compromising the entire structure. Moreover, moisture trapped beneath the paint will cause damage to the masonry over time, shortening its lifespan. The proposed work does not comply with this standard. 
paint is not easily removed, requiring professional expertise and extra care. And when done without using the gentlest means possible, the brick may be further damaged. Finally, regarding the standards here, the appellant claims, sorry, the appellant, sorry, <laughs> claims the paint used in this case will allow the brick to breathe. However, no evidence has been provided to staff substantiating this claim that the paint formulation eliminates all risk of damage. Paint would still not be appropriate regardless, pursuant to the guidelines as extensively elaborated upon in the staff report and further materials. Then <clears throat> just to speak a little bit further on the removal process, the appellant's materials include several claims regarding the paint removal process, including a witness report from a professional painter. One of those claims is that paint removal would violate the standards of review, um, notably standard seven. Standard seven does stipulate chemical treatments that cause damage to historic materials shall not be used. That's not the entire ordinance. It goes on to stipulate in the very next sentence, surface cleaning of structures, if appropriate, as in this circumstance, shall be undertaken using the gentlest means possible. The witness claims removal of the paint would not be possible without grinding a quarter inch off the brick face. However, multiple examples of paint removal, including striated brick as seen on the subject duplex, may be found within walking distance. Even, even You could even see them from the subject property. And those are documented in the staff report. The appellant, uh, instead of citing those other ones, cites a duplex at 217 West 300 North as an example of how chemical removal allegedly damages the brick. I think it's worth noting that the paint at that property is being removed to correct a similar code violation following two denials by the Historic Landmark Commission. Furthermore, information the current concerning the precise process to remove the paint has not been provided, not to mention the process they're using appears to be unfinished. Um, there's simply insufficient information concerning a different property that's not this property to definitively ascertain the circumstances there. Conversely, the examples provided by the city show that when using the gentlest means possible, as recommended by a qualified mason, as this is masonry work and not a painter, the paint is not only effectively removed, but the historic brick material is preserved as well. If the paint removal process were as noticeably damaging as alleged, then perhaps those buildings would have been pointed out. However, they were not. And then just on the note of other properties, <clears throat> Uh, specifically those other painted buildings. As mentioned in the staff report, the conditions under which those other buildings were painted are ultimately irrelevant um, relative to the circumstances under which this property was painted. Um, Catherine, do you have anything you'd like to add, Michaela? Noah, can I ask you a question? Um, yes. As, as to the traditional uh, masonry that was not traditionally painted, should not be painted standard. Um, is, is there something about this post-war period uh, that, is there some history? Why were they unpainted? Well, well I guess I'm wondering, are post-war period masonry or, or brick constructed buildings, were they not painted as opposed to maybe other historical buildings that were painted? Do you know? Yes, I can speak on that. So um, you can look. There are three, like I said, there's the third in a series of three duplexes constructed from that period. It was actually constructed by the same developer. This part of the historic district was something of a planned development. You'll see that in the 217 West duplex. That is why it is of a similar design. So the historic characteristics, it's not just the unpainted brick that's the subject here today, but you see similar elements such as the location of the entrance, the location of the windows, for instance, or a corner window. That's indicative of that period of time. And among that is the unpainted masonry. And that's third in a series of duplexes. There are other duplexes in the district. So that when you look at that period of history for the district at that time, unpainted masonry is a hallmark of the historic character from that period. Were there other periods where masonry, uh, where bricks specifically were traditionally painted? Um, I'm not familiar with any immediately at hand. Michaela, are you aware of any? Uh, no, but I mean, getting to that design guideline, I mean, obviously there are a 
number of pens on the board within our local historic districts, people have painted historic buildings. Um, that are quite old. Um, and if they've been painted, we allow them to continue to be painted depending on the nature of the stone masonry that's been used. Um, getting to that design guideline of traditionally, I mean, traditionally is like traditionally wood is painted, right? Part of the historic integrity of a masonry building is that actual building material itself, its color, its texture, cumul cumulatively um, allowing that structure to have a contributing status and retaining its historic integrity. It's all the components. Um, so traditionally it can mean a past practice, right? Um, and a past practice, if it was traditionally painted, we would allow it to be painted before. It also means traditionally, um, <clears throat> sorry, I just lost my train of thought for a second. Um, a past practice, adhering to a past practice, and that's never been a past practice um, within our program. Okay, uh, thank you for addressing that question. Uh... Go ahead, City. So thank you. Um, I won't repeat um, the arguments. I think the party's positions are well briefed and extensively argued. Um, so I will not go in detail, you know, through in detail all of the city's arguments. I understand that you've already reviewed them and will have ample opportunity to do so after this hearing. I just wanted to touch on a few points that you asked specific questions about. Um, the first being, has, you know, Mr. Anderson waived the, the argument about a COA not being required. And I agree that that argument makes more sense in the context of an enforcement action, but we typically, you know, rather than doing multiple appeals, um, we think it's best to just kind of um, group any challenges to what the um, zoning ordinance requires into you know one appeal just for administrative efficiency sake and you know avoiding inconsistent interpretations inconsistent rulings on the same um basically very closely related administrative decisions okay um you asked um about the traditional you know what does painting brick traditionally mean in this context i think the city applies that and interprets it as both you know, whether that on a property level and on a district level, it's com it's analyzing has the masonry, various types of masonry on a given property, were those painted? And like Michaela was stating, then if they were, then they are continued to allow to be painted. And also on a district and looking at other um, properties of similar historical significance, are those painted and those inform as well as the general you know directive of the historic preservation regulations to avoid completely unnecessary you know color change preferences like this that change the historic character like painting a house white those are to be avoided and i think the city as we wrote in our brief just fundamentally disagrees that you know color isn't related to historic character. It's very clear from the rash of, you know, home brick homes being painted white, that that is an attempt to achieve a clean contemporary look. And that is directly contrary to all of the goals of maintaining a unique historic character of a district uh, like Capitol Hill is. Now you asked, you know, why is automatic approval of the application of an appropriate remedy? And I think for at least three reasons, it's not an appropriate remedy. First, like we already covered, it's not provided by ordinance that that's what Mr. Anderson's remedy is. Second, the remedy is that he gets to come to this hearing and present any and all you know arguments that he would like um, related to his application and was you know permitted by the third of July, by May, and 
at the time he submitted his minor alteration application to submit any and all materials that he wanted the city um, or you as the hearing officer to consider. And um, then, you know, um, is there any procedural defect that isn't cured by this hearing in your opinion? Um, I, I will get to that in okay. just one moment on the procedural um, due process arguments, because I think there are several layers to that. Um, but just on the automatic approval piece, it's also just not the appropriate remedy because Mr. Anderson was promptly informed that approval wasn't possible under the standards. And just because there was a delay in issuing the formal written decision, when he had already gone ahead and painted the brick, it's not like this prevented, you know, construction crews from doing work that should have been permitted. He had already done it impro improperly and contrary to ordinance. So there's not really any prejudice here. And so approving it um, as a matter of law on a, on a timing issue is just not appropriate. So the procedural due process issues, we've never prohibited Mr. Anderson from responding. That's simply not the case. That has never happened. He has been allowed to make any response and in this hearing has responded at length to all of the arguments the city has made that he has, you know, has submitted voluminous materials, has provided ample argument, and I think some claim that he hasn't been able to submit something in writing just isn't um, a right that he has. Courts don't have a unlimited deadline on when written submissions can be submitted. The city has followed its policies about when written submissions are due. Those are both so that the city can prepare the materials um, by staff in order to respond and as well for the public to be aware of what the party's positions are. And let's say even if there is a problem that, um, for example, if you had declined to allow Mr. Anderson to submit the SIR rebuttal that was submitted yesterday, the remedy is provided in 109A801 that if the district, if Mr. Anderson, um, if depending on your ruling is displeased with that and appeals to the district court, and the district court says, yep, that sir rebuttal should not have been excluded, then it can be included, you know, in the record before the district court. So that remedy is amply provided. But again, because Mr. Anderson has the opportunity to respond, and again, due process only requires notice and an opportunity to respond, not an endless opportunity to respond in writing, I think that um, procedural due process has been amply met by the city's processes and procedures. And just lastly, wanted to touch on, you know, the remedy not being appropriate, the remedy being removing the, the requirement to remove the paint. Um, so practically speaking, you know, the city has provided evidence that, that this has been required in the past, and that evidence is highly relevant to both illustrating how the city's ordinances are interpreted, as well as showing, you know, as a response to Mr. Anderson's argument that he made that the city is targeting him in its enforcement. Um, I think this, the, uh, the information and other properties and letters of enforcement that the city provided is highly relevant to those issues. As a matter of process, there has to be a remedy for Mr. Anderson's violation of city ordinance by not getting a COA prior to painting the house to read and construe the city's ordinances to such an extent that there's no remedy for this violation, I think makes a, a mockery of um, the city's land use um, powers and police powers. And the cost to remove the paint is just simply not relevant. The financial implications are entirely self-imposed due to Mr. Anderson's failure to get approval to do that work um, in advance. Now, the bulk of Can I ask Mr. Anderson really quick. Of course. So we're, we're, we've been talking about um, the appropriateness of the remedy. It, it feels like in in the enforcement action, in terms of is is removal of the of the paint an appropriate course of action to take here? Is this is this something again that should be decided in 
in the enforcement action or is this something the the parties are looking for a ruling on in this appeal i mean i think it's not something that you would order i think it is a necessary implication by your upholding if that's what you so choose to do the city's administrative decision denying the certificate of, of appropriateness uh, the civil enforcement will um, take, if if that were to be your decision, would then, you know, interpret that, that that decision has been upheld. Therefore, there was no certificate of appropriateness for this work. Therefore, to be able to not be in violation of the city's ordinance any ordinances anymore, the work must be undone. Okay. Sort of that's um, how that process would, would happen. Or Mr. Anderson would remain, you know, accruing fines for the zoning violation of not having the certificate of appropriateness. And then as to the, the examples of prior enforcement actions regarding this issue, um, I, I understand the relevance as, as far as uh, proving um, that you're not singling out Mr. Anderson. Um, and, and there may even be some relevance regarding uh, what traditional means, maybe. Um, isn't it true, though, that that no deference should be given to the city's interpretation of its code? So uh, it's not, I, I feel like that is a different question. That That is uh, probably the appropriate legal analysis for what does the ordinance require? But it doesn't mean that the information isn't relevant or admissible in this proceeding, which is essentially what Mr. Anderson is saying, that that material should be struck entirely from the record. And I feel like that goes a step too far. It, I'm not saying that, you know, this is what the city has done in the past. Therefore, um, Mr. McKnight, this is how it must be, you know, interpreted going forward. I, that's not the city's position. It's more, you know, illus illustrative of um, the, the city's consistency and the city, you know, indicating the type of um, exterior alterations that are enforced against. And again, um, as a, you know, rebuttal to the claim of, of being singled out. So just on the the various arguments about what the ordinances and the standards say, essentially appellant's argument boils down to a lack of specificity argument that because the ordinances and the design standards don't specifically say you can't paint your house, you can't paint without a COA, then he is basically asking you as the appeals hearing officer to throw up your hands and say, well, the city's ordinances just won't be enforced. All of these uh, regulations that direct that exterior alterations must be pre-approved, that exterior alterations should not be done unless they are done in very specific ways, those just are not going to be enforced because of these, you know, liberal construction arguments and I just think that goes much, 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 much too far than what Utah law requires. There is a lot of uses and actions that cities regulate as part of their land use authority that are written according to a class of property, a class of activity. Just because farming regulations aren't written to cover sheep farms and alfalfa and pigs and goats and they just talk about farming doesn't mean oh we can't regulate a sheep farm or we can't regulate you know pigs doing these things they just become you know void for vagueness kind of things that's not really how land use regulations are interpreted or how they're practically enforced the building code requires that a building permit be obtained for every type of building activity unless it's specifically exempted by the building code. And that doesn't become, you know, vague and unenforceable just because it 
covers a broad variety of activity. And that's exactly how the city's ordinances and design standards are written and function. They, it is broad. It covers every structural, you know, ex alteration to the structure of a property in the historic district. And that is exactly how the design standards are written. They are written from a general discussion of alterations and how alterations are not, like should not occur and does not, you know, specifically drill down into any type of alteration that could occur. And it doesn't become, you know, thrown, all of those regulations should not be thrown out on that basis. Okay. So uh, the question that I have is um, under subsection E, and this is, I think, pre-ordinance 67 language, right, that we've all been discussing. Um, it talks about, uh, obviously, the uh, no alteration in the exterior appearance of a structure, site, object, or work of artifact in the landmark, landmark site or property within the H historic preservation overlay district should be made or permitted um, without a certificate of appropriateness. And then it goes on and provides that list. My understanding is that the city's position is that that list is a a list of kind of for example. Is that correct? That's correct. Um, it, it's an, a list of examples, and it informs the type of exterior alterations that are covered by the COA requirement. So, Mr. Anderson's, you know, well, you can't mow your lawn without a COA. You can't wash your windows without a COA. That's not of the type of alteration being covered by that list. So, the list informs the general requirement. And the you know work that was done is within the type of things covered by that list. And that is why the city doesn't believe that that list limits or rules out um, the, the more general requirement and its applicability to the work that was done here. So <clears throat> I, I understand that's the city's position and um, I, you know, many ordinances have similar lists, right, to kind of explain um, and, and to help developers, homeowners, whatever, kind of understand uh, what, what sort of situations would apply. Usually, um, if you have a list that is of this type, um, you have language such as uh, including but not limited to, or for example, um, and then where you have lists where it's it applies only to these situations, you you wouldn't have that language. Um, why why should this be considered the list of this type as opposed to an exhaustive list of of uh, these are the only situations that it would apply to without that language, such as including but not limited to, or for example. So I, I think the, the coin goes either direction. Would it be ideal if it said, you know, including but not limited to? Absolutely. But also, does it say only, a COA is only required for these? It doesn't say that either. And I think both uh, 21A34020E and the, um, sorry, I don't have the reference on top of, I think it's 21A. 040030, both of those must be given effect. Both of those must be interpreted together. And they're both consistent with requiring any exterior alteration to have a COA. Okay, thank you. Anything else? That is it, unless you have additional questions and which I'd be happy to respond further to. We do okay. still need to technically open the public hearing, even though we no longer have attendees. Okay. Um, let me just make a quick note here. Okay. Um, I guess uh, one, one question that I have for the city uh, uh, is regarding the uh, pending ordinance doctrine. Um, 
me pull that up here. So in 10A, 10.9A, 509, uh, subsection 1, um, A, Roman numeral uh, 2, right? It talks about um, kind of this, this, this pending ordinance doctrine where um, if, if the city has initiated uh, uh, under subsection 1A, Roman numeral 2, subsection B, <laughs> uh, if the city has is, is initiated proceedings to amend the land use regulation, in this case, the ordinance, um, in a way that would have prohibit approval of the application. Um, I, I, I'm curious what the city's position is on that. If if the city has said that procedurally, the changes um, provided in Ordinance 67 should apply, I'm curious what the city's position is as to whether substantively they should apply as well under that. Um, and I guess one of my follow-up questions there is, does the city consider um, formal initiation of the proceedings to be uh, to have occurred on um, on February eighth, twenty twenty three, when the mayor initiated the text amendment? So, our position is that yes, it was formally initiated on February eighth. So, on that basis, the pending ordinance doctrine doesn't apply because that would be more than six months um, since that application was made, but the statute, it, we interpret that statute as substantively, we needed to review that application as we did under the pre-Ordinance 67 standards, but procedurally we were permitted to um, review it administratively. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, uh, nothing else from the city then? No. Okay. Uh, we'll now open this up uh, to for public comment. If anybody is here, we would like to make public comment on this. There is nobody in the attendees list. Okay. Um, where no one is here to make comment, I do see that public comment was a, a written public comment was included in the staff report. Um, but otherwise, we'll close the public comment period. Um, and uh, with that, I'll turn the time back over to Mr. Anderson. And Mr. Anderson, if uh, we are quite a bit over time, and, and, and I have to apologize for that. I was not uh, keeping track of that initially. Um, but uh, I, I still would like to give you a, a chance to rebut what the city has argued here. Um, but if you could just... Uh, get out what you need to, but, but be concise with it. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Your Honor. I will be uh, brief. I won't go through everything. Uh, let me just touch on a couple of points. First of all, as I've listened to the city's presentation, it's been excellent. They've done well. But the one thing that is unmistakable is that there is so much ambiguity in the language that they rely on. It could be interpreted many different ways to mean many different things. They've acknowledged that it's so broad so that it can kind of cover everything. But it has to give fair notice to property owners so that they know what is required. And not once in any of the ordinances that we've discussed uh, does it say plainly and clearly that you cannot paint exterior brick without a certificate of appropriateness or that if uh, a certificate is requested that it um, uh, can be denied for painting exterior brick? Not one mention of exterior brick other than the guideline 2.6 which doesn't apply. Um, remember 
despite what the city's saying about their efforts to try to cover what they need to cover, the law is crystal clear. It's binding. They can't avoid it by simply dancing around it and saying, well, it's hard. The law requires that if there's any ambiguity, if things are unclear, it's interpreted against the city and in favor of the property use. This is a significant property use that the city seeks to strip away from property owners. You can't paint your own home. And yet, the city doesn't once in its E uh, Section E ordinance restrict painting, not, not in the 13 paragraphs. Uh, it doesn't say it once. And it doesn't say in any of the actual standards for issuing a certificate of appropriateness that you cannot paint exterior, built, uh, exterior brick. It doesn't say it under the law. You have to interpret against the city and in favor of the property use. Otherwise, the law is violated and the city's interpretation is contrary to law and illegal under 10-9A-801. That is the bottom line. And I think after the presentation today, as well as the city's done, they have just underscored the amount of ambiguity and the fact that it doesn't clearly state what they say it states. They have to give notice to property owners. That's point one. Point two is they made a reference again to, uh, I think it's 21A-04-030, which is this ordinance dealing with um, uh, demolition permits. And it has one phrase, one sentence, I should say, uh, that refers to certificates of um, uh, appropriateness. The city says those two are perfectly in alignment in reality, they're directly conflicting because E, section E, that we've talked about at length, um, is limited to exterior alterations. That's what the specific ordinance governing certificates of occupancy or certificates of appropriate, certificates of appropriateness says. Um, o 3 isn't restricted to exterior. O three O applies to any any improvement where the um, where there is an enhancement of the value or excellence of the property. That is so vague; it's without genuine meaning. The one the one issue that is clear though is it's not limited to exterior improvements. Um, so O three O that that shouldn't even be a, a real issue in this case. Um, just one last comment. This isn't a response to an argument, but I would ask your honor that you read the brief that we filed and you said you'd accept. I appreciate your doing that. Thank you for your courtesy. Uh, if you would carefully read that, I think it will answer many of the questions that have been raised in a very um, uh, appropriate way. Secondly, uh, in connection with our, our filing and with the email exchanges we've had today about uh, the submission of this uh, response to the new st uh, staff report, we have asked the city to include into the record the email that we've exchanged. That didn't occur until today, and so it couldn't have been provided before but I think it is relative uh, or relevant to the issues of fairness and appropriateness and due process that we've discussed. And so I would ask that those be included in the record. Thank yeah. you. Robert. Thanks. All righty. Uh, thank you everybody for uh, your, your presentations and argument. I did helpful to, um, to be able to ask the questions to clarify and, and and better understand each each side's position, um, uh, I I will take this under advisement and issue a decision. Um, 
I, I before I do that, I would ask the city to forward on uh, Mr. Anderson's uh, response brief as well as uh, uh, email exchanges between he and the city, uh, which I will receive into the record um, at the very least for for preservation of of, of arguments there. Um, and uh, I, I guess my last question is, City, uh, do you anticipate needing to to provide any additional evidence or anything in rebuttal to Mr. Anderson's submit uh, submission from yesterday? I think all that we'll provide um, at your request is that red line of of Ordinance sixty seven to the prior ordinance, okay, yeah. and we'll, we'll, we'll limit it that. to that. Okay. Perfect. Well, um, yeah, I'll, I'll wait for the city to, to forward those things on and uh, make them part of the record. Uh, and then uh, I will issue a decision on this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That I guess will end the public hearing.